actually been great uh, to talk with you. Thank you. And now I think we're going to, Jean, we're going to open it up to questions. Yes, we are. Thank you so much, Richard, for a wealth of information that you presented to us today. We have quite a few questions, so I'm going to do my best at combining some in key topics that our audience would like to ask you about today. So the first question is regarding schools and the push to hand children from grades K through 12 a screen for their personal use. And um, the question revolves around what can parents do when schools are choosing to invest in screen time, which could include gamified software and other things, entertainment uh, type videos during school time. How can a parent address the school administration, feel like they feel like they're between a rock and a hard place and they want their kids to succeed academically, but they feel as though they are working against the school with their own screen limits. This, we are in a really tough spot. So, many of, so much of the tech industry is moving through schools to, to convince administrators that what kids need is screens. And it's, it's sad to me to see all this investment, uh, billions of dollars go to um, uh, screens and phones in school in, instead of teacher salaries and investing in, in the school itself. Um, it, we are in a tough spot. I, I encourage you, I, I can promise you that there are so many parents, when I go talk at schools, uh, parents oftentimes feel alone. And you know, after my talk, we've got uh, parents standing up and supporting one another. I encourage you to reach out to your school community through your PTA uh, and, and bring uh, facts. I understand that there are lots of opinions about this, but there are powerful facts about what screens are doing in kids' uh, schools. You will find those in the book Screen Schooled, uh, which is a powerful resource. You will find, if you go to the London School of Economics, and look at what happens when we bring smartphones in schools. You will see that it hurts kids' schooling. I encourage you to reach out. Under, we have to understand where we are right now. I, I know it is, um, I, I do know it's tough for parents, but understand you are on the leading edge. Parents are starting to put themselves out there. They are, when I go to talk at schools, they are, uh, parents are, are starting to uh, form their own wait until eighth communities. I encourage you to, to look for other parents, reach out to other parents in your PTA, in, in the school community, and, and, and I guarantee you there are many parents who think just like you do and are wanting to take action, and through that coalition, that's when you are going to start to push back. Great, thanks so much for addressing that question. And the next one we have is regarding to parenting and limits. And what do parents do when they do set limits and kids are resenting the parents for those limits? Also, when parents do set limits, sometimes they feel that their children are being ostracized or being left out of the mainstream. And how can you address that issue that parents are up against? Uh, I, I think I'm going to speak a little bit to, to this about what happens uh, at, at home. We're, we're in a tough spot with respect to the community as far as you know, I've got a 14 and 10 year old um, kids who I think are, 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 are quite bright, but they don't have, they simply don't have the prefrontal cortex and they do not have the understanding needed and the life knowledge to understand and they're immersed in this peer culture, which is pushing them towards tech. They don't have the ability to understand why um, uh, the, the limits that we've set at, at, at home. So it does make it more difficult. If Again, if you went back to 1850, families would come together at, at, at churches or the town hall and they would build this together. We need to start building this, this, this groundswell uh, through kids' schools and that does happen. It starts happening in schools and you will talk with parents. So build a community. And for the time being, you, we do have to set limits on our kids that they don't completely understand. And what we're, we, we you, you can do, we can do our best to help kids understand. Um, we, we can say that this poses risk. You can show them powerful articles like have smartphones destroyed a generation. 
um, and, and, and help them see that. And some kids do, do, do notice that. Um, and, and so talk with kids, understand that they aren't going to completely uh, get that. And then I think the other question was, um, are, are kids gonna, going to resent that? We, we need to understand that it, it's time to push back. Just frankly speaking, uh, this isn't easy to do, especially again, we are on the leading edge of this. We need to act. If we don't act, um, all, our ki all our families are just gonna be prone to more and more marketing and, and immerse themselves in even more uh, screen and phone culture. And it's gonna, it's easier for me to stand up because I, every day in my practice, I watch kids come in who are suicidal who are cutting on themselves because they're living their lives on phones and not connecting with family. So if the more you immerse yourself in this, the more you live that life and the more you see kids fail uh, school because they're living their lives on, on devices, I get the benefit of seeing that every day in my clinical practice and it makes me be a stronger parent. So I encourage you to immerse yourself in these resources and that's going to steal you and give you the, the strength that you need to come to talk with your kids. And if we talk with our kids in a, heartfelt way and we show our kids that we're staying off our, our, the devices ourselves uh, for playtime, um, that our, our kids are going to hear that and listen to that. Great. Thank you. And while we're on the topic of parenting, um, you mentioned parent communities and we have parents asking, what, um, how can I approach other parents? about these topics when it can be sensitive, when other parents can feel judged and they're concerned about offending other parents, and yet they have a desire to connect. As you mentioned, the wait until eighth communities. How do we introduce these to other parents without offending them? And oftentimes when we see other parents that may themselves be addicted to their devices, how do we broach the topic of setting screen time limits in support of each other? Um. I, I wish, I, uh, Jean, you're giving, you're not giving me any uh, softball questions. I, I appreciate <laughs> that. These are, these are the questions that I get um, um, when I'm in school. So I appreciate those. Um, it, we, we have to understand it, it's, it's tough. A, a lot of parents are truly addicted to their own um, d devices. And uh, it's, I believe this is keeping uh, parents from being able to think, many parents thinking uh, clearly about this issue for, the, for their kids. They, I, I work with many uh, parents who are truly addicted to technology and as a result, I see their kids falling apart. I see their kids cutting on themselves and ending up in the hospital because they truly do not have a mother or a father. So, uh, it, and it's, I believe it's keeping parents from thinking clearly. How can we approach uh, families? I, again, I think that f firstly, I, I don't think you need to do this alone. I, I can promise you, um, when we just see, bring, bring the facts, bring all these popular media sources. Again, look at that, the open letter to Apple from leading investors two days ago. That, that is a remarkable, uh, and, and that lists uh, facts about what is happening with kids. It lists facts about, because there's lots of different opinions driven a lot by people who have a vested interest in loading kids up with more devices, but they're there really is only one fact. Uh, do devices, you know, it goes one way or another. Are these devices helping kids' emotional health or, or hurting it? It's, it's hurting it. It is remarkably clear. Take a look at uh, Dr. Gene Twenge's research. Bring that forward. Um, bring a look at that learning habit research. Is it helping or hurting kids' school success? It's hurting. So there's a real difference between opinions and facts. And then bring those in a nice, caring way and understand you'll be helping families because understand that so many families come to me and say, well, we used to believe that all these devices were helping us. And now our, our daughter's in the hospital and our son is not going off to get a job. Understand that initially it may be some friction, but they're going to be thankful later. Great. So I have a question here, Dr. Fried, that I'm going to read to you ver verbatim. I'm a parent who does not need convincing about setting screen limits. I need tools for creating a connection when limits I've set are pushing the kids further away from me. Can you give some advice? Um, I, I'd be interested to know um, how old um, uh, the, the, the kids are. I, because the, of the format here, I, I had to cut off 
um, a little bit of my presentation at the end, which was talking about prevention, because it, it is true. Once I, I did talk about addiction and addiction effects uh, and how powerful these devices are, once they get their teeth into, into kids and once they become preteens and teens, unfortunately, I believe kids' brains ha have changed. It, you, you become like a parent working with a kid who uh, has a drug or an alcohol problem. And an addiction hijacks the areas of the brain that, that gain insight. Um, and it, the addiction hijacks areas of the brain that, that have attachment. So what I wanna have parents do is start from when kids are really young. Um, it is really, really tough to, um, you do have to do more compromising once kids, once smartphones, once these, uh, once gaming, once social media sinks its teeth into kids and they are obsessed with it and spending a lot of time, you do risk um, uh, a, a disconnection. And then unfortunately, we as parents, we have to compromise with our kids um, more than I would like to, more I ideally than if, if we had, and this isn't parents' fault. Uh, the reason why this has happened is because parents have been sold lies uh, about how all these devices are really going to be helpful. So parents have under, understandably followed along with this, but so much of this is really our, our, our miss, which have destroyed this. So when that happens, I do encourage, it has to be every single um, parent or caregiver that's involved with, with, with that child or teen coming together. If there are grandparents, if there are separated parents outside the home, everyone needs to be on the same page. And then what you need to do is, is do everything you can to engage a, a, this, these devices push family away. You need to insert family back in your child's life. We're, we're not eating with, with uh, we're eating away from screens. We are, a lot of families that I'll work with will take a, a week long trip um, and they'll say, we're putting all our devices away. And then they reconnect with kids. They have a wonderful time and they say, you know what? When they, they, they continue that when they come home, they say, this was so good. What we're gonna do is we're gonna continue limits uh, the, the way we had them when we went away. Great, so we're at four o'clock now, we're a little bit past, so I know that people need to go. We are really thrilled about the attendance at this webinar. I'm gonna close out the formal portion of the webinar right now, and then Dr. Fried has agreed to stay online for a few additional questions. We do have quite a few more questions, if we can fit some more in. But I'd just like to let everyone know that this webinar has been recorded and will be available for you to share with your colleagues and to revisit and that um, our next webinar is Thursday, February 22nd at 4 p.m. Eastern time with Dr. Depesh Nafsaria. The topic is screens, success or sabotage for schools and how can we best advise families? So I think we will have some of those questions regarding schools addressed by Dr. Nafsaria as well. And registration for this next webinar will be in your follow-up email from this webinar and um, can also, will also be found on the events tab of our network website. And again, I wanna mention the conference this April that Dr. Fried also mentioned, will be coming together face-to-face -to, -face to learn from leading experts on this issue and discuss a lot of these questions, collaborate and choose practical solutions. And that's April 20th and 21st in Boston. And you can find registration is available now and early bird registration available on screentimenetwork.org slash conference. Thank um, you so much. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending today. Wonderful. So for those who are still online with us, we have some additional questions for Dr. Fried. First one is on the topic of teen depression, which you discussed. And the question is that, um, would you address the spirit of meanness online? And do you see this as a contributing factor? Uh, very much so. Uh, kids are not, uh, uh, there, there is something that happens when we look at a person in the eye. It's, it's very difficult for humans to be able to uh, denigrate someone face to face. Online without uh, someone's eyes on us and without that, that social context, really um, uh, words go flying. And especially with teens with their less prefrontal uh, involved prefrontal cortex. So really two things are driving teen 
uh, depression in, in my mind with respect to screens and phones. And I believe that is, is, is Dr. Jean Twenge shows, that is the factor driving our girls, especially their, their depression, cutting, suicide. Uh, if, if there's anything that you want to do, you need to, are concerned about in your life, I can't think of anything um, more powerful. But there's really two factors driving that. One um, is that, and, and I don't think enough attention is paid to this, but talk with kids and they are on their phones um, away from family. They're living their lives out in their room alone, disconnected from family. Or even if they're in their parents' presence, if they're driving in a car, look, look over next to you at, at the teen in the car. They're on their phone. That used to be a time when you could talk with your parent about what's happening at school or some kid bugging you. So that's one element that's driving our kids' depression. The second one is the actual content. When kids are on there, they're, they're, they're teens, talk with, talk with your preteens and teens. They are involved oftentimes in a, especially girls, uh, a, a lot of nasty girl politics, who's in, who's out, uh, and, that, and, and, and it is anxiety producing. Uh, kids will, um, we need to understand the reality of teen relationships. They, they, they quickly change in and out. Uh, friends one day, uh, not friends the next, or I'm actually uh, ridiculing you online, happening way too much. And there's also this fear of missing out when, when kids are um, scrolling through uh, um, social media posts, everyone's presenting this lovely uh, life, look what we're doing and you're not here. Over time, that looks like that is driving our kids' depression. So between cyberbullying, fear of missing out, those are content factors. Um, yes, driving kids' depression. Yes, driving kids to miss school. Driving kids' suicidality. Yes. And the the the, the whole, and, and there's, we can ask kids to be nice, but the truth is, if they're going to be living their lives on phones, they're going to be more nasty with one another. We need to have kids spend time with family in real life, and then also have kids spend time with each other in real life, oftentimes in a setting where there's like a, a teacher leader or a coach helping guide our kids. We've always understood that uh, uh, teens need to be apprenticed and helped. Now we just turn them loose. Um, on their phones and in their bedrooms and we're see, seeing what's happening uh, to this generation. The next question we have is regarding, you've talked a lot about family connections and you've talked about academic success and school outcomes. Can you speak to physical effects of screen time, such as obesity and sleep issues? Uh, there's, uh, I'm sorry we didn't have it or I didn't have enough time to talk about those today, but those are, are there. Our kids' wired lives are depriving them of sleep and um, sleep, I, I don't think I get enough uh, sleep, but uh, that's less important when you're an old guy like me. But for our teens, that is a, a, a powerful factor driving school success. You talk with kids um, falling asleep in class. Uh, uh, chronic sleep dep uh, uh, deprivation leads to uh, depression. Um, and we need to get these devices out of kids' rooms, and they need to put them away and keep them in common locations. Kids cannot keep their hands off of these devices. Kids are going to say to their parents, well, I listen to music. Oh, yes, that's what you, you're saying, but you're also getting texts and uh, uh, pings at 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, oftentimes uh, upsetting ones or, or things of that sort. We need these devices out of kids' rooms because they can't uh, control them. We also need... Um, uh, to understand the American Academy of Pediatrics says that kids' um, um, lives on screens is a cause of kids' obesity. Uh, I, I, if, if you can see that link, the American Academy of Pediatrics, or if you really need to reach out to me, I can give you that link. But it is, um, it, it's really clear. More time that kids spend on screens, the, the, the more problem that they're having with obesity. And our, our obesity rates for adults and for kids are not getting any better. And the, and the trend line has really been, if you look at it, it's been waving around, but it looks to be up. We've got to get our kids outside in nature and put these devices uh, away. Our next question, Dr. Freed, is about parent modeling. And first of all, at home, we have parents who need to use their computers a lot for work. And much of the time, their children are around and seeing them using those 
frequently for work. We have a librarian who suggested that a lot of times she sees parents and children together. The parents are focused on their devices rather than on their children. And then also at sporting events, we often see the parents focused on their device. They're there physically, but they're not connecting with their child. Can you comment on that, please? I'll just comment on the last one. Dr. Sherry Turkle in her book, Alone Together, I think she talks with kids and they name the top three um, uh, things that really tr truly bother them about uh, their, their parents being on their devices. And I believe one of them is when they attend events that kids aren't being watched, that the parents spend their time on the device. So yes, that is hurtful uh, uh, to kids. Um, also, uh, when, when kids, we need to understand that there is a difference. I, I work on the computer at home uh, for school. And what I try to do is I role model for, for kids. You know, when they see me working on my computer, they see me working on, they see me writing, they see me making a, a, a PowerPoint, they see me um, uh, practicing talks or uh, something. They, they know I'm working. It, kids, it, by the time they're three or four years old, know the difference between a parent working on their device and a parent consistently uh, th going through social media and chatting and he seeing all these videos and playing games. Kids know the difference between working on your device and then playing on your device. And that being said, we also need to carve out times to help our kids say like, see that, oh, well, at such and such time, we are on our devices, but we also need to really carve out times. I really like what France did recently, which is uh, not only do they say no phones in schools, but they also are having businesses not allow th them to, to be pinging parents at uh, 11 o'clock at night or even eight o'clock at night after such and such time. Families, you know, it's a big difference between sort of carving out time and then constantly being interrupted on your phone at dinner. Oh, I can't get this. Kids feel that. If, if you, if, um, Yes, we need to, that's why at, at schools, I see that too. It's so tragic to see uh, parents come uh, on their devices and pick up their kids from an after-school program and not ever engage with their kids. And those transitions are so remarkable. And you can see these dejected, sad kids following along uh, behind their parents. We need to put those devices down and then look our kids in the eye and say, I love you and how was your day? And a lot of kids are going to say, oh, fine. And, but, you know, they're also going to know we're invested in them. And then in about 20 minutes or a half an hour, they're going to start talking to us if we have our device uh, put away. So thanks, Jean. That was a good question. Thanks. And I'm hoping we have time to get a couple of more questions in. Um, one question, very poignant question that we just received has to do with teens and their perception of the meaning of life. So teens seem to believe that at, when they're at an event or a party or some kind of social gathering, that that event means nothing unless it's posted on Snapchat or Instagram. And how can we intervene and change that mindset? That's when we need to look to wait until eight. Um, it is remarkably challenging, I would say next to impossible to, uh, if not impossible, to convince teens to make sense of that. They live their lives um, but we need to understand as uh, educated um, adults that have this prefrontal cortex that see the big picture, um, we need to help step in for kids. Right now, we've got wait until eighth, which is uh, we want communities to understand that we want to push back the age when kids uh, get phones. And wait until eighth is, is, is great. We also have Andrew, uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Drone, Doan, who... Um, wrote Hooked on Games, he's encouraging families to wait at least until kids are 18 before they get smartphones because wait until eight is, is really good. We also need to know that giving kids um, phones when they're 15 also still puts them at risk to not do well in school and not do um, uh, well in um, uh, uh, emotionally. So Right now, we need to start with Wait Until Eighth, which is this wonderful program. We need to get parents at least waiting at, until eighth grade um, to, to, to do that. And once, th and then you'll have kids over at your house uh, where they're not having phones and they're able to play with one another and engage with one another and actually talk. And then as parents, a lot of parents I talk with um, say, in, in my car and in our house, we're going to ask kids that come over to put their phones away. 
And what you want to do is set up other places where kids can hang out and talk and play. And actually, a lot of teens are kind of thankful. I like going over to so-and-so's house, actually, because the other, you otherwise have these kids saying, I go to kids' houses and everybody's on their phone and I can't talk. So as a parent, understand that you can set limits and kids are going to be thankful for those. That's great. And one last question. It will jump from the parenting perspective. I did have those kids coming to my house who were appreciative that we didn't have a screen. So I was grateful that you had that response right then. But going to the perspective of a teacher, a teacher of very young children, that they're starting to see children coming into the classroom as early as pre-K and they're referencing and speaking the dialogue of the media that they participate in at home rather than engaging with the students. So referencing perhaps violence or inappropriate content that they see and then influencing the play of other children. The child struggles to engage um, and yet other children are brought into that media play. Can you address, you know, what are teachers supposed to do in that situation? How can teachers intervene um, when, when certain behaviors are happening at home, are allowed at home, and those limit, limits that you're talking about aren't being set at home. I, I really, really like um, the example of, I talked about how uh, the Obama Kids School, Sidwell Friends, is reaching out to families. Um, I believe it, as a, as a single teacher, um, just like it is tough for a single teacher to address uh, phones in school, that it really needs to come from administration. And just like a single teacher, and it's hard to just talk with parents, I suggest we come together as a school community and, and, and talk about this. A lot of schools are doing that. Again, Sidwell Friends, uh, talking with in a school community, and again, understand, you know, why would schools uh, do this? Because what's happening with kids at home is having a profound effect on kids' uh, uh, behavior, school success. P teachers 20 years ago used to not have to deal with kids falling apart and cutting and, and suicidal. Yes, that's because kids didn't have, weren't living their lives on phones. That's now affecting and hurting the school environment uh, for kids to, to focus on school. Anything that happens that really hurts kids' school success, I believe is the purview of the school community. Let's talk about it as a community and reach out, talk about the facts, reach out to families, uh, bring this together. Um, and and um, so yes, as a teacher specifically, if you do feel that, that uh, maybe at the beginning of the school year, if you want to pass out something and say, here's some research and we're really making an effort in this class because we've seen negative impact. Yes, if you're a teacher and, you, and, and be brave and you can do that, I think it would be neat if the whole school would do that. In any case, when you talk with families at the beginning of the, the school year and you have the, the principals or the headmaster's message, here we go. Let's, I can't think of a more important uh, issue to, to address than our lives, our kids' lives spent on screens. So. Thanks, Jean. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. That's a great way to wrap up, having teachers and parents work together, schools and families getting on the same page and working together on this. So I can't thank you our, to our audience. What a great, great large audience we have for our first webinar. We hope to see you on February 22nd. Thanks again, Dr. Freed, and goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jean.